Welcome everybody to Blame the Tools, Crafty Robots, Well-Behaved Implements and Disobedient Devices. It gives me great pleasure to kick off this afternoon's event. Uh, my name is Professor Becky Early. I'm from Chelsea College of Arts, University of the Arts London. And the first uh, 10 minutes, I'm just going to give you some housekeeping, some orientation, and then a very quick keynote presentation. Uh, Dominica, Gabrielle, if we could have the if the if we could have the slide up, that would be great. Then I know we're all ready to go. Dominica, are you there to start the slide? She's disappeared. She's starting now. She's starting now. Oh, wonderful! Thank you so much. Great, okay, so very quickly, the housekeeping, this event is being recorded. So by default, all attendee video audio will be off when you come in. If you don't wish, wish to accidentally be recorded, please ensure that you keep your camera off and your microphone on mute throughout the event. As I've said, there is a good use of the chat bar during the session and there is a special Q&A area for all attendees. Please use the chat to converse and comment and the Q&A box is there specifically for questions to be asked of the speakers and panelists. I want to get going by making sure that everybody knows how to use the chat bar, you know where it is. If you go to the bottom of the screen, there's a bar of tools, you should be able to see a little speech bubble, press chat. And seeing as we have such an international audience this afternoon, it'd be brilliant if you could just leave us uh, where you are, what city, what town, what village, or what hamlet even that you might be in this afternoon. And then we can get a really good idea of where everybody's dialing in from. Straight away, we've got London, of course, thank you. Loughborough, Aberdeen, Glasgow, Lexington in the USA, Brazil, Cornwall, Leicestershire, Leeds. Cambridge, Greece, Kilkenny, Ireland, Hong Kong, Korea, South Korea, Suffolk, Plymouth, Nigeria, uh, Hereford, Birmingham, Galway. Brilliant. Welcome to everybody. Uh, it's fantastic to, to have you all here this afternoon for such a really great lineup of papers. Uh, where are you today with us? Well, you are with University of the Arts London. Uh, we are six colleges and some 20,000 staff and students um, spread across different campuses. Um, specifically today, you're with Chelsea, Camberwell and Wimbledon Colleges of Art. Uh, and this event is taking place within the research department uh, at the design school uh, at CCW. I'm actually talking to you as the director of one of the research centres at CCW. I'm co-director of Centre for Circular Design, where we conduct practice-based research into circular, con circular economies of the future uh, through three lenses of materials, models and mindsets. And tools play a pivotal part um, of our work, whether that's the tools in which we make our practice-based research or the tools that we develop and share then uh, for teaching and for training and for consultancy and knowledge exchange, we, um, we embrace and we see the tool as an inherent part of our um, everyday practices. Um, when Jason and Adrian started to put the themes of this uh, event together, along with the committee, um, there was, of course, heated discussion and, and on a broad number of levels around what a tool is and what it represents and what it means to us all today. Um, what personal connections do we build through our tools? What connection do we have with our tools? There's almost a fetishism around our tools, how we care for them, how we look after them, how we collect them. Are tools helping us craft new sustainable futures? Are they making stronger connections between people? Are we sharing our tools? Have we become closer to our tools during lockdown? New ways of making are emerging, new kinds of tools are emerging. 
and we're going to hear a lot this afternoon from many different uh, makers and professionals around how they use tools and what their relationship is with their tools. So in an attempt to capture some of these ideas, I've written a love letter to my favourite tool, my most loved tool, my heat transfer press. So let me see if this works now. I should be able to advance the slide. Oh, go back. Right, I think I've got control. Thank you. Right, a love letter to my heat press. When I first met you, I was a student at Loughborough College of Art. You were a hunk of old metal that no one was much interested in. But during a swimwear design project, a spark of interest ignited between us. And later at Central St Martins, you sat there in the middle of Soho, calling to me like a temptress. We fell deeply in love. I discovered new ways to be creative, to be expressive, and we shared Many, and we ended up sharing many, many secrets. On graduation, I couldn't leave you. I needed you. But it was hard to get to you, to have a long distance relationship. I had to somehow own you for myself. You were expensive. £10,000 in 1994 was a lot of money. Only the price of a car, my, my MA tutor said. And when he put it like that, it seemed like a much better investment than a dirty old car. You were a great investment. You helped me dress Bjork with Ed, Edward Enningthal. You helped me dress Alec Weck and Kylie Minogue. Those were such good times. But I couldn't afford to keep you, to house you in the space you needed, in the style you were accustomed to. I had to pay such high rents. I even considered moving to the countryside just to be able to keep you. But that wasn't going to work. So I sold you. At least you went to a good home. You went to keep the other heat presses company at St Martin's. I was given limited visiting rights. So next, you helped me reach into nature and connect in a way I could never with floral designs. And even though my gardening designs, my skills didn't improve so much, with you, found objects became striking fashion prints onto old polyester shirts, giving new life to old clothes. New collaborations, new combinations, new connections and new possibilities emerged. You changed me. You changed my work. There came a moment when making stuff on my own, just with you, was less meaningful than making stuff with other people with you. We had show, you had shown me so many wonders with materials, it was time to share this wonder more broadly, more widely. It was time to, to use it further, to further the messages around sustainable fashion and textiles. If we could, these are jumping. There's one in the middle there, you have to. Thank you. If we could use old clothes to make new clothes together, we would be free of the clutches of fast fashion. You gave us the joy of creativity together, social, sustainable style. The years have gone by. Next slide, please. You have stayed the same, just a few more dents. I have changed. I went off and left you for a good while. I explored digital printing. I thought our time was over, but it wasn't. In 2018, I came back to you. I brought the new knowledge from my travels into the land of digital tools. And so, next slide, we made new shirts together. Shirts that would last 50 years. Circular, sustainable, stylish, Swedish, as it turned out. Next slide, please. Then in one last twist in the tool tale, I bought your baby. I kept it at home, down the end of the garden. I never need to ask for permission to use you. You are here with me always. Next slide. We only need to make small, but small, but very special pieces now. I use you to help me in my research with material scientists for the circular economy. We make visions of the future. We bring it closer, sample by sample. 
Thank you, Heat Press. You've been faithful, trustworthy, consistent, occasionally inaccessible, but somehow through all the ups and downs, always there, ready to make. Okay, so without further nonsense from me, it gives me great pleasure to hand over the day. Oh, the last slide there is a book launch on the 21st of October. If you'd like to find out more uh, about um, our research at Centre for Circular Design, then you can find us on Eventbrite for this event. And now over to the chairs. Thank you. Hello. So my name's Simon. I'm the Dean of Design across Camberwell, Chelsea and Wimbledon Colleges. Um, first off, I hope you're all very, very well in these strange times. Um, and secondly, welcome to what I think is going to be a fantastic afternoon of discussion and debate. Um, there's quite a few things that are close to my heart, but perhaps not least tools. Um, the idea of how we're making is, a, is an essential part to my practice and to have a symposium that talks about tools is, is very, very important. But perhaps what's interesting is, is to understand its relevance. In this kind of, in the current situation, in the current global pandemic, how can possibly what we're talking, be, talking about today be of any relevance, of any meaning? So perhaps that's the kind of challenge I have as a dean to kind of ensure that design is seen to be relevant, that our practices, our methods, our approaches are seen to go beyond the creative industries. And perhaps what we're going to hear and see today is examples of approaches, methods, adoption, adaption, evaluation, hacking. And it's those kind of methods and processes which designers, creative people, have, the, have, have, have at the heart of their practice, which I think is essential to future solutions as they relate to global challenges, societal issues. So I think today is going to be an interesting moment to kind of explore the value of design as it's seen through approaches to making and how the tool is an essential part of that. Um, I also love the word crafty and to actually see the word crafty deployed in relation to robots makes me very happy indeed. Um, I use the word crafty many, many times. I think it's a, it's a term which is kind of loaded and there's a duality to it, which I think is, is wonderful. Within that, what we can see perhaps hidden is guile, is cheek, is the way that actually there's an intelligence in, in crafty, which is about how we understand the potential of materials, the potential of processes. And again, this goes back to our creative method and the value it has in terms of how that can transcend the material, can transcend all things into new spaces. And again, kind of gives us a kind of strength of arms, so to speak, in terms of how we can exhibit, how we can demonstrate, how we can put forth very comprehensive and perhaps fundamental understandings of the worth of creativity, the worth of design. And yeah, that's something that I think is sort of crucial to my role and is crucial to the things that we explore within the design school at Camberwell, Chelsea and Wimbledon Colleges. So I think I'm now going to hand over and wish you all a very, very constructive, enjoyable uh, afternoon and welcome everyone from all around the world. Thank you very much. Hey, hi, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a bit like standing in an auditorium with a blindfold on. <laughs> but I, um, I, uh, it's a, thank you, Simon, for that, that introduction and thank you, Becky, Becky for your um, excellent introduction there as well to our symposium. Um, I, we've got a few housekeeping notes we need to, to um, go through. So Jason and I are going to go through those in a partnership. So just to briefly explain the timeline and the format for today's symposium, it's essentially going to be run around two round tables, um, which will be with where the participants will give a 15 minute presentation and then there'll be questions and answers at the end of each um, round table. So there's two round table sessions. The first one is around risk, um, which essentially I'm gonna help um, um, sort of moderate, although we also have uh, Mark to help us with that. And we'll introduce Mark in a minute. And then also um, the next round table is around certainty. So in terms of the housekeeping, um, ah, one of the key things about the housekeeping is we will finish at six. This is, um, I'm, those of you who are now familiar with the new 
world of Zoom, um, it will it will quickly close out at six, and therefore we're all very minded by time. And actually, I'm minded that we were going to have ten minutes to do this little intro, and actually, we've only got three. But let me just quickly say what I was going to say. So the event, as I mean, Becky's already introduced who we are and what we're doing. And but I should add, our we're obviously um, uh, Chelsea, Camberwell, Wimbledon, UAL, but also we are um, uh, our partners. And our partners are we. We're lucky to have Kings Kings on board sponsoring us. And Christian Heath will also talk. And then we're also lucky to have, um, we're in partnership with London Craft Week as well. So this event has been advertised as part of London Craft Week, which many of you may have seen listed. And then also I just want to say quickly, a mention to the people behind the scenes. So we have Gabrielle Grigorieva, who's been our research events administrator, and then Dominika Kamara, our technical support, and Mia Cormack, who's doing social media. So thank you all. Okay, I'll carry on with the house, small amounts of housekeeping we have. So attendee mics uh, should be muted throughout the webinar. Um, please do use the chat, as we've, as we've mentioned before, to communicate with each other and use the Q&A button as well to ask questions. I believe you can raise your hand if you want to speak. Uh, I want to introduce Mark Hooper, who is, is our moderator for this afternoon. He is, amongst other things, the founding editor of Hole and Corner, a magazine dedicated to celebrating craft, beauty, passion and skill, who also put together the wonderful publication, The Story of Tools. If you haven't seen that, grab a copy because it's fantastic and it deals with some of the issues that we're very interested in here. We also have Christiane Mantz, Mats, sorry, who is um, illustrating the event for us today. Uh, she's a narrative-based illustrator and educator. Her practice centers around the observation of the everyday um, she'll be live illustrating throughout the event. Audience members are also um, welcome to direct questions to Christiane and she'll be happy to join the Q&A as well. Also, please do use the hashtag blame the tools uh, uh, in your conversations on social media. We'd be really grateful for that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, thank you. We were also going to just sort of give a little sort of overview as to the symposium, which was an idea that we came up with, both Jason and I, as the co-directors. And essentially, we recognize that tools are changing. Um, and new tools, especially digital, are, are breaking some of the practices and networks of old, be becoming more friend user-friendly, empowering wider, more diverse communities. Um, we recognize that materials are now extensions of these tools potentially and tools are multitasking and more portable and in the moment of making we're now more able to be in that moment of making because of all the extra qualities that tools potentially have so where tools are now changing they're also changing how we use materials as well as how we use tools so we just thought it would be fun to kind of capture this moment and somehow get as many people in a room together who can tell many myriad different ways in which they use tools and in which that changes their practice. And that also forms new practice, new materials, and potentially new tools. Yeah, so um, I'll just wrap this part up by saying we've been working on this for a long time. Uh, and we've seen throughout that despite the extraordinary diversity of approach to materials and disciplines, uh, there's a lot of commonalities which are interesting to uh, share, uh, as well as consideration of what actually, as Becky said earlier, what constitutes a tool. And I love the broadness of that, and I love the specificity of that. And I just looked in my drawer, and there's all sorts of interesting things that you can pull out. And perhaps one of the most important ones is this, but anyway, I'll over to Mark um, to carry on with the moderation. Thank you. Hi. Thanks, Adrian. Jason. Um... Uh, just to reiterate, if you have any questions for the panelists, use the Q&A tool you'll find on the bottom of the screen rather than the chat. Chat's just for general comments. But if you want to ask a comment, um, ask a question to any of the panelists, we'll go through these at the end of each session because um, obviously we don't want to in, uh, eat into other people's time. Um, so without further ado, the, the theme of the first panel is risk and um, Phil Ayers is going to deliver the key, keynote, uh, which is on cultivating biohybrid approaches for architecture. So Phil, if you're there, you can put your screen on now and I'll disappear. Thank you very much for the introduction. 
Mark. And uh, also thank you uh, to Adrian, to Jason, to Gabriella, and the rest of the team for the invitation. It's a tremendous honor to be here sharing this work with you. And also, I mean, fantastic ability to show resilience, uh, show agility, show fortitude in the uh, pivoting from a physical uh, seminar um, and reconstructing this as an event that has really opened up a massively expanded audience, it seems. And it's tremendous to be speaking to people all across the globe. Um, so I will now share the screen. I've chosen to title this talk, Living Tools, Tentative Explorations in Biohybrid Architecture. And uh, I can imagine that perhaps there's something contentious about uh, this title. Firstly, what on earth is a living tool? and also the implication that architecture is a tool. Um, hopefully I'll unfold some of these arguments as we progress through the talk. Uh, the talk is structured around four um, threads, establishing grounds and definitions and arguments, uh, the challenges that biohybrids present to orthodox architectural practice, supplementing the tool set of practice, and then offering some perspectives on the relevance and need for these living biohybrid tools. So what is a biohybrid architecture? So I define this as architectural systems that seek to couple, uh, tightly couple living complexes with technical elements to construct spatial organizations and material boundaries. There's a special focus on symbiosis uh, with the idea that we're creating symbiosis not only in the links between the tightly coupled elements of the living and the technical, but also to broader systems, broader environmental systems. The idea of biohybrids um, is not novel. Um, there are other researchers out there, such as Bell Botanic currently, but the history of this really does extend quite far back. Uh, if we look at the beginning of the 20th century, the work of Arthur Wichler, um, really introducing some kind of deep scholarship into the idea of um, adjusting living material into configurations uh, that can meet architectural objectives. Even further back, this is the first bit of scholarship I've come across uh, from 1716, Friedrich Kaufner, really establishing some principles and basic principles in the idea of um, tuning and turning biological living material into uh, design form to achieve architectural aims. So we have a long history there. Now to, to move on to um, the idea about qualifying the notion of the tool, um, I'd like to argue that tools act as interfaces between, intention, between intentions and synthesis of those intentions. And that's a definition that carries from both um, physical tools, but also through to digital tools. Tools mediate and they privilege um, and also bias our complex interactions with the world. Um, this is through um, uh, and can be described, this can be described both for um, digital tools and for physical tools in the same way, through the idea of the control system and through feedback. But tools also participate in establishing social relations, in establishing practices and also identities, both of individuals and also communities. Tools symbolize and embody values, ideologies, and also even ethics. So this, I think we can relate to in terms of our experience of tools, such as the hammer held by the apprentice in Louis Emile Adam's painting here. But I, I'd like to suggest that these definitions actually carry through to a broader understanding of what tools might be. And here I'm drawing upon Ivan Illich and his book, Tools for Conviviality, where he describes um, his understanding of tools as all rationally designed devices, be they artifacts, rules, codes, operators, and to distinguish all of these planned and engineered instrumentalities from other things, 
not deemed to be subject to rationalization. Based in this expanded definition, I would argue that architecture itself can become understood as a tool, and this opens up interesting potentials. So what are some challenges that biohybrids present in terms of orthodox architectural practice? Well, if we're talking about coupling living entities with technical elements, we have to appreciate that the living complexes change and grow continuously over time. And this really sets a challenge to architectural practice, which is very much focused on the idea of the end point. Another challenge is trying to find symbiosis between the living and the technical in ways that are mutually beneficial for both. In this case, we see that we have a artificial weave and this is providing some support for the growing beam, which is being controlled by an external controller uh, through light. So here we see that there is symbiosis initially to start supporting the beam, but eventually to actually add structural performance to the weave. It also, biohybrids also challenge conventional practice in trying to find new ways of interfacing with our biological entities. This also includes having to learn the methods of stimulating response and being able to tie these to um, architectural objectives. And finally, but not exclusively, there's the idea that biohybrids require continuous design over time. And this requires the idea of being able to offer specification across a time base for objectives that we want our architectural elements to meet. It also requires us to be inventing new kinds of controller, new kinds of tools that can essentially compile high level architectural objectives down to low level stimuli and, and control methods uh, that, that relate to the living complexes that we're working with. So to exemplify um, some of the methods and tools that we're using to explore these, uh, I'm going to run through two projects. Uh, flora Robotica and Fungal Architectures. So Flora Robotica uh, was an EU funded project. Um, it incorporated uh, uh, six project partners. Um, these were drawn from across Europe and were highly cross-disciplinary. So it involved architecture, robotics, computer science, mechatronics and sensing, cellular biology and zoology. And the aim of the project was to look at how we might be able to grow architecture through establishing a symbiosis between distributed and decentralized robotics and living plants. The hypothesis here is that we have a living, um, continuously growing architecture um, that is controlled and, and grown through, through these new technologies. So we begin through the idea of trying to understand behaviors in relation to environmental stimuli of plants. And we drew from a horticultural understanding of the idea of um, supporting plants in early stages of growth um, through, through scaffolds. But through our material combinations, we could also imbue these artificial elements with behaviors. And we could also begin to investigate them as things that might artificially grow in uh, collaboration with the living complexes that we were tying them to. So here is um, an example of um, handcraft uh, looking at exploring the morphological possibilities of braiding, um, working with ideas of bifurcation in the braid system to create these rather um, wonderful um, and complex morphologies uh, of artificial scaffold. Once we had produced those, um, 
from an architectural perspective, it becomes very important to be able to try and represent these. This is not only an argument about being able to quickly um, investigate their potentials uh, and examine them in broader contexts of environmental performance, but it's also a way through which we can start to uh, understand fabrication logics and also produce fabrication information for the instruction of other machines. And this became important from the perspective of actually constructing these machines uh, in modular ways that allow for reconfigurations uh, so that we can uh, investigate this idea of growing the artificial scaffold for the plant. So here we see the braiding robot. It's in a fairly conventional configuration, but essentially each one of those larger cogs um, is a modular element and we're able to switch between um, subsets, subsets of relations to actually start creating bifurcations in the material that we're producing. This then extends to perhaps using, uh, rather than uh, predetermined machines, starting to look at the idea of swarms of robots uh, that might be able to uh, not only braid um, architectural elements, but in this case, actually start braiding um, electrical systems as well. The result of this was um, integrating these elements to start having a form of um, artificial scaffold in which plants can be responding through new interfaces to controllers, um, which became ways in which we could guide the growth of the plants, um, understanding how that growth starts to affect not only the local conditions on the scaffold, but also uh, the, the, the local conditions around the architecture itself. So here, this is really about developing representational tools that allow us to really consider the life cycle or what we might term the growth career of the architecture. Moving into fungal architectures quickly, um, the objective of this project is to develop a fully integrated structural and computational substrate using living fungal mycelium. And again, this is for the purpose of growing architecture. So here we see um, an example of a uh, construction concept. And here, this is the, the, the very first forays, uh, preliminary experiments establishing the plausibility of using um, fungus as a computing and sensing device. In this project, which is also funded by the European Union, we have four partners. Mogu, our industrial partner, University of Utrecht, mycologists, University of Bristol, Unconventional Computing Lab, and CETA, us, this is us, uh, in Copenhagen, looking after the architectural aspect. As mentioned, we're uh, focusing on the idea of using Kagomi Weave uh, as a way of being able to create morphologically complex scaffolds which can be filled with inoculated substrate, acting essentially as a stay-in-place formwork um, but also as a reinforcement um, to the mycelium composite. We're investigating how it is that we can begin to automate the braiding. And in this case, you see that we're looking at um, singularly curved geometries, just to be able to establish the principles. But the real challenge is how it is that we start to move into double curvature which starts to offer us greater spatial consequence through strategies such as branching. To do this, we've had to extend our representational tools, allowing us a greater agility to modify meshes on the fly and to be able to introduce the principles underlying Kagomi, which are this, this idea of singularities. These are methods by which we induce double curvature essentially by changing the size of the polygon um, that we're looking at. And there are, there are clear principles that govern how it is that that induces negative curvature or positive curvature. Again, this is an important aspect, this representational work, not only to 
um, investigate for ourselves, but also to produce instruction for robotics. So here we have the robot producing um, uh, a sheet which has two dislocations or two singularities into it. And here we're beginning to speculate about um, making volumetric weaves. That work covers um, what are ongoing investigations and, and really work in progress. We are only eight months into the project. Um, the work I've just shown uh, looks at the, the scaffolding aspect. Now I'm going to focus a little bit on how it is that we're looking at the um, fungal aspect. What you've just seen here is um, essentially a stack of images from uh, confocal microscopy taken by our partners in U University of Utrecht. That is of a mycelium network, which is something like about one millimeter cubed in size. Building upon some of the uh, computational principles established by our partner in unconventional computing, Andrew Adamatsky, um, he's shown how um, vascular networks can actually be used to um, instantiate uh, computational logics. So here, the, the question is how it is that we can be looking at these topologies to understand the potential of creating computational logic. On the left, we see these half adders. Um, these are ways, uh, this, is a, this is a computational unit. Uh, it takes two inputs, but it can produce three outputs. Uh, one which is an AND and then exclusive OR gates. And what becomes interesting from our perspective is being able to analyze the confocal microscopy that we've been given by our partners to convert that into a 3D understanding of the network and then to run uh, scripts that and analyze, tools that analyze this network to identify the various um, topological conditions so that we can begin to map these to these kinds of logics. The speculation here is that we can then actually describe specific kinds of um, circuit within these mycelial networks. At a different scale, we're also investigating how it is that these composites uh, can be structured uh, the idea that we can actually design the properties of material by including organized fibers. So mycelium composite, you can see that the stuff that is moving very actively in the CT scan here is the debris that the, um, the mushroom is growing in. And then we've added these organized elements, this, um, these um, elephant grass elements, which provide orientated fibers which provide um, greater uh, performance in terms of loading, but can also be used as ways of registering assembly, for example. In here, the CT scan is um, allowing us to see how, how well the colonization has occurred, but also to uh, observe the idea that internally we're having our live mycelium that can be operating computation. It becomes very important from, from, a, from a deep design architectural perspective that we can be understanding um, across scales. And so we're developing um, simulation frameworks that, that build upon existing tools, grasshopper, ladybug, honeybee, for example, that allow us to understand the positioning of elements within exterior conditions, um, to understand the impacts, and then to translate those into interior properties. Um, this uh, is work uh, by uh, Emile and Adrian on the project team and the interior properties is really tr trying to look at ways in which we can simulate things like moisture movement to understand how it is that the mycelium is actually colonizing and how it is that we might be able to intervene and steer that through the structuring of material. Here's an example of um, some of that interior modeling, the principles underlying it structured point clouds that allow us then to identify uh, structured um, fibers, uh, the idea of seeding moisture maps. Oh, uh, have we lost Phil? 
Hello, uh, am I still there? Yes, you're still there, Phil. Okay, Please continue, you. sorry. No problem. So um, just to put this work into perspective, and I, I think uh, I'm getting close to my 20 minutes now, um, what is the relevance and the need for these kinds of biohybrids, these living tools? So if we look towards the news and to reports, and I think we're all very aware of the fact that we're living in uh, an unprecedented, unprecedented age of um, cha environmental challenges that also have social um, impacts. Uh, we can see that uh, beyond just climate change, there are even more pressing issues. Loss of biodiversity, soil degradation, species extinction, uh, all more pressing than climate change has been uh, as described in, in this report here. And the, the, the social consequences of that are, are really going to be immense. No longer uh, is this report on the right talking simply about flagging the issues, it's actually asking us to face up to the, in, to the social consequences of environmental breakdown. So um, in the building industry, we really have to acknowledge that um, our industry contributes quite massively um, in, in terms of waste, in terms of energy use. And this is largely to do with the fact that we are still operating in an industrial paradigm. Uh, this industrial paradigm privileges the idea of resource extraction, um, uh, resource movement, uh, does so in ways that uh, destroy biodiversity, that, um, that, 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 that create um, real problems in, in terms of uh, the, these, these things that I've flagged. Um, there's, there, there are paradigms which are looking at the idea that what we should be doing is creating greater efficiencies and re reductions. But my feeling is that this doesn't actually resolve the underlying issues in terms of the damage that is being done. And on top of that, we have pressures in terms of population growth and urbanization that um, require us to essentially double the building stock over the next 40 years. And my feeling is that this, this challenge really outstrips the possibility of gaining any of the benefits of reduction and um, greater efficiencies. So the question there is, um, how, how is it that we might start to look at new paradigms that offer viable alternatives? And this is where I think to bring back uh, to the, the question of tools, biohybrid architectures can be tools that can help us to bridge between intention and synthesis in relation to redressing our path of environmental breakdown. Um, Biohybrid tools, these living tools, can establish biased interactions with the world, but biased towards resource balancing and towards ecological repair and to increasing biodiversity. And finally, I think bio hybrid tools, can these architectures can also act to embody the values and the ideologies that we hold, spatially structuring our environments materially, performatively, and aesthetically. Um, Biohybrids really are living tools that can disrupt our current trajectory towards preferred courses of action. So with that, I'd like to conclude and I'd Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much for that, Phil. That was fascinating. Sorry to loom in the corner like a <laughs> doomsday. Um, fantastic. Uh, um, we'll discuss this more when we get to the panel, panel um, discussion. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Adrian Friend, who's going to talk to us about robotic craft and material as tool. Hi, Mark. Thank you for that. Sorry, a bit of technical lag on the um, handover. So yeah. Um, let me roll into my um, presentation. I'm going to share the screen and I'll be able to talk about robotic craft. So this is, this is me as a maker architect, part of the 24th Biennale of Design in Slovenia. This was me chairing um, a talk on maker practice with um, Tom Kundig and Anthony 
Engi Mikot from Assemble. Um, this was some of the papers that I mentioned that, that kind of frame the way I work and what I work on. And this, so essentially, you know, understanding the way makerspaces work, the type of equipment that's in a makerspace, the, what, the sustainable way in which those spaces come together and also the impact on local communities and the drivers that also fuel that, that, that way of working, which is obviously sustainable. And also by its nature, local, so breaks the kind of global um, manufacturing chain that's been established by the Industrial Revolution over, for the last 200 years. And essentially, you know, the, the recent pandemic sort of accelerates this change, actually, because we are seeing already that the global uh, movement of resources is not happening and, and or is certainly broken at the moment. And if we're seeing then the emergence of a spiral production of ecosystems. So within, so out of this kind of way of um, making, you know, through local maker spaces with, with people who have an affinity with materials and processes of, and tools comes robotic craft. And um, essentially, you know, the fab labs have been looking at ways of assembling in a different way and making in a different way, but going back to craft. And I think here is the first 3D printing coil slip pot from stratigraphic porcelain project of 2010 by Unfold Design Studio in Belgium, working with Potter and artist Jonathan Keat. And these, these are recognized as, they, they, in 2011, they were the first, um, um, the first, this is actually recognized as the first printed 3D clay pot. Um, and, it, and it's also recognized that the, the origin of additive manufacturing in clay goes back to the Neolithic pot. So it goes back maybe 4,000 years to a process where the where clay piping was just coiled up. There was no potter's wheel. It's just laid on top of each other. And essentially the 3D printer does something very, very similar. And there's even been studies on these kind of Neolithic pots, how the process of coiling is kind of lost in the making because you can't see the coils, but then it's added in decoration. So the rope form, the, 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 the cordage is kind of reformed as decoration to, to, as a lasting memory of the coiling of the clay. And this essentially also relates to textiles and decoration and, and, and clothing of the time. And here, um, some samurai armor from a similar um, German period in Japan in which, you know, the, the, the cordage is really a, a decorative example, which also then transferred arguably to the pots. And again, this sense of robotic craft and connection with, with ancient processes and ancient ways of making, but making them in a different way, was, was shown just recently, just now by Phil in, in his reference to his projects with the um, Kagami um, bamboo basket weave, which is scaled up. And essentially this was a prototype shown at National School of Architecture of a Size. And this was the exhibition um, of Life of Clay where, where Dr. Guan Li, who I then worked with on the V&A tile, was already working on volumetric examples of coiling and, and clay piping and, and essentially taking the Unfold Design Studio pot and scaling it up. So Guan was already working architecturally on a much bigger scale and, and, and essentially exhibited his research outputs at an exhibition at the um, uh, Royal Institute of Architects called Life of Clay. Um, so then when, when we were then working, to, so Guan and I then worked together on this, um, the VNA tile, and that essentially came out of those volumetric studies that Guan had already done, but they were not, he'd never done a tile and it never been sort of proposed as a, as a, as a possibility. And so this is actually the first tile, 3D printed tile, and, and, but it's very different approach to the other sort of volumetric um, digitally led 3D printed components in that this one is all about repairing and to ameliorate a space and to actually make something good. So essentially the VNA um, floor of, of the new VNA shop needed to be filled. And essentially these were the, these were the fillers. Um, and so the story of the VNA tile sort of starts with the research project that shadowed the design and build of a new space within the VNA where the gallery 43 was transformed into two pavilions, a pocket workshop and a jewelry pavilion. And these were added to the space, but, but in adding them to the space, the floor that they sat on was destroyed or parts of it was destroyed. And hence these new carpets of ceramic had to be, were sort of offered as, as, as possibilities 
it of retaining the existing limestone floor, but repairing it and adding in some decoration. And essentially we were looking at a strategy which, which promoted the making that took place in the shop. So also, and in, and in the maker space within the VNA. So we also were, were promoting that, that the same process was used to make products that were then sold in the maker space and in the shop. So here is examples of um, some of the 3D printed pots that actually came from the same process. And again, the shop itself and the, the maker space within the VNA was was also it was a complete test bed. Was a test bed for lots of different processes of manufacturing. So including uh, water jet car, cut glass structures and new ways of assembling that we again we tested and prototyped. So the tile was just one of those examples. But the tile was also a really good way in which we connected with the collection. And again, that's one of the reasons why the VNA was kind of pushing us in that direction. And again, this this is quite an interesting point because it talks about the role of pattern and kind of goes back to the Neolithic pot. So we took the pattern from one of these Ottoman bowls and then we applied an algorithm and the algorithm kind of starts to turn this into a line. So drawing becomes program and, and that program allows us to model it in three dimensions. And then also it allows us to kind of output it as a, as a manufactured piece. So the pattern and the drawing and the program is, a, is essentially one thing. And then the tool is they all come together in the print. And essentially we, we, we were looking at, different types of print and different scales of print. And um, these are some of the ceramic carpets. And then this is the maker, and this is, this is the maker in the print. Um, and it's, but, it's, so, but essentially the, the, the tile is then essentially part of the tool, because it's actually a, a representation of the way the tool works. So, so what's come out of this project is then, is then another project looking at the simulation and the scanning and the way in which um, computer vision can add extra precision and quality to the repair process. So we, we work with scan clouds and photogrammetry, and then we also work with animation. And essentially you animate the making process to actually understand the making process, but also so you as a maker can be in the making process. So in other words, the virtual becomes again, an extension of the tool. It becomes something that can be ex experienced virtually. You know, one can stand in the room with the making being made, but even if it's virtual. And essentially this kind of picks up a really nice theme which design critic Rainer Bannum mentions in, well, well, in the 1950s, um, in which he defines gizmos. And, and he starts to talk about the way in which small self-contained units of high performance whose function to transform some undifferentiated set of circumstances to a condition nearer human desires. And he's talking about this sense in which, where the maker possibilities, when manufacturing is not just redistributed, but potentially handheld and portable. Um, and you know, what would be the potentials for that in the micro citizen sec sector, if materials were then, were then actually made locally, but with handheld materials. Because, and so we looked at this option of a manufacturing is now affordable and how, and, and essentially we looked at how to do the tile, but in an affordable version using a different material, but the same process. And um, this essentially allows us to rethink materials and tool as one. So the making and the installation are coming together in an autonomous on-site application. Your minimal, the minimal tooling, the multi-tool is a product of, the multi-tile is a product of the multi-tool. The head or the nozzle is the only component you need to alter to convert the VNA tile into the P tile, which is then this tile that then emerged from the VNA tile. And where essentially we're testing out printing cordage and coil, but with much finer print heads. And, and this, is, this is then essentially offering much more kind of targeted and honed repair work on a, in a myriad of different conditions through just repairing what needs to be repaired and not replacing anything. So in other words, you're extending the life cycle of materials, you're being, it's frugal innovation, it's, it's low use of resources. And also the actual tile that you're printing is multi, multifaceted, it's got multiple options. So there's options in which the tile is, um, is different surfaces are looked at, different ways in which it fuses together, um, you know, and essentially the idea is that these tiles and these tested samples become examples of manuals for citizen-led repair. So in other words, what we're, what we're building is a kind of 
repair manual, which will be handed over to, um, to citizen-led led maker spaces, which will then be able to do these in an affordable way. And so the PTAR has an infinite number of variable patterns and will be printed by the same tool. And this research, in my view, will be, the, the, will be a way of demonstrating how tools can change our thinking of how materials are used as well as made. So the multi-surface tile comes together in, in many different ways. This was this was a very short. We have been doing research on 3D printing clay for the last three years. What we thought was perhaps clay as a material could be part of this kind of digital revolution. We had a Turkish pattern from an Ottoman bowl and then we had a Chinese pattern as well and we had various different patterns that were taken from the collection that we then digitally altered and drew and then put in place some very clever algorithms into the pattern which essentially were self-generating other patterns. The robotic arm is controlled digitally to produce lines that in a series produce an overall form. It's a bit like using the robotic arm to coil. The robot is simply a new tool and the programming is just another way of drawing, another way of modeling. It's new and to be able to produce consistently a couple of thousand tiles in exactly the same appearance, shapes and sizes, it's quite challenging. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Adrian. Um, talking to Blame the Tools, had a few technical <laughs> glitches holding things up, but um, we've put up a decent amount of time and uh, we'll, we'll cut some of the panel discussion short at the end if, if we need to, so we don't, um, we don't lose any uh, important um, time from Liz and everyone who's following after. So we've got, we've got those disobedient devices. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so <laughs> next, next up we've got, um, Liz C. Werner, um, who's going to talk about, I hope I pronounced this right, Hinkelklotzchen uh, and the disruption, myth, and beauty of a cybernetic object. So, Liz, if Hi you're there. Hi, everybody. Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much for the invite. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure. It's also a pleasure to see Adrian. We sort of, you know, bump into each other at, uh, at occasions, and we've known each other for like 20 years or something crazy like that. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, I'm going to share uh, my presentation here with you. Okay, can you, you can see everything here? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, now, uh, this is a very long title, Hinkel Kletzchen, Disruption, Myth and Beauty of a Cybernetic Object or a Script, Print, Sensories and Play. Um, so the second line that you see here in the subtitle, uh, is, is more or less the, the process. Um, the first line that you see uh, is kind of the, the desire that uh, underlies that, uh, that process and that design. Uh, my name is Lissy Werner uh, and I'm a professor of bioinspired architecture and urban design at TU Berlin. It's a, it's a small chair that uh, comes out of the um, chair of sustainable urban planning and design. So um, the uh, Hinkelkletzchen is part of a project which is called Get Home Safely. Uh, we did this in uh, 2019. Uh, and the question was, how can we uh, create uh, devices within the city that could reduce light pollution? Uh, it's, a, it's a smart city project, but it's also a well-being project. Um, so I just lead you through this little movie here. Uh, we have started looking exemplary into the city of Berlin, uh, close to our university, and uh, choose some of the darker spots that we regarded as being uh, relevant uh, and uh, simulated uh, the flow of people uh, through um, uh, using a methodology of multi-agent um, behavior. Uh, and then I had a look at how would lights uh, react to people, how would they turn on, uh, turn off, and uh, how can we basically guide uh, these agents to their final uh, 
uh, destination. Just going a little bit further. Uh, so here you can see or uh, gather somehow how these lights would um, uh, give basically one light, uh, one lamp would give the light to another lamp uh, in accordance to um, uh, the person who's carrying a device that mm -hmm. is connected to the lights goes from one place to another. So that was kind of the background. Um, the uh, project, as I said, uh, deals with cybernetics in the first place, uh, scripting, printing, sensorizing, and playing. Um, cybernetics for us gives the principles of creating an ecology through communication. Uh, the script is in the widest sense, the design, uh, the printing, the making, the sensorizing, the actuating, and to bring this piece uh, to life. Uh, and the playing is the implementation of it. Um, now, ecological systems um, are relevant to us uh, on one hand uh, for cyber-physical systems, on the other hand um, also to what was mentioned uh, by the previous speakers, especially Phil, uh, how do we, uh, how can we insert biology or uh, what we call nature into our uh, habitats. Uh, there's uh, just three of the, the people that, um, whose research and knowledge is relevant to what we do. Uh, one is uh, Jakob von Uxkö, uh, who defined the term Umwelt uh, and the inside and outside. Uh, the second one is Humberto Maturana, uh, which we all know from uh, autopoiesis. Uh, uh, the third one is Stellark, uh, representing a, a symbiosis between a uh, machine and human body. The diagram that you can see on the right hand side uh, is um, uh, designed and developed by Niklas Luhmann, uh, a German sociologist uh, who also used cybernetic principles. And we do see uh, that we do have uh, various kind of systems here uh, that do uh, inter interlock with each other and uh, that, that, that uh, work together in one, uh, I would also call it uh, biology. So um, uh, before we script, um, uh, we started, or I started to, to sketch out what that Hinkelklötzchen would be. Uh, so we do start with, uh, with, it, with sketching uh, in some cases, uh, unless we work with uh, slime mold or um, other branching uh, systems that work on uh, uh, self-generation or self-organization. Uh, in a second step, uh, like uh, you normally do, we start uh, looking into uh, modeling that piece. Uh, this is the shell that we designed for that Hinkelklötzchen. What you see in the very front uh, is, uh, is a hole for um, a proximity a sensor. Uh, what you see in the center picture in the back is a little hole for um, a sound sensor. Uh, and inside we also have um, uh, VLAN uh, network sensors. Um, the actual module uh, is uh, made out of uh, three components, let's say that. One is the, uh, the top um, shell, um, the, the sort of uh, head it has uh, with sensoric and light. The second one is a battery module. Uh, and the third one is the base where we also um, could uh, structurally fix that piece into into the ground. Um, this diagram may be a little bit too small for you to see on your laptops or screens. It depends on where you are. Uh, you can also find it on our website in the project, uh, project uh, subpage. And it gives you an indication of how uh, a user in a dark space uh, would actually use that, uh, that cyber physical system. Uh, so you would ask the question of how to get from A to B. Uh, you would have an app, which is the Hexalite app uh, that gives you a navigation map um, that all communicates uh, with a cloud. Um, it tells the lights that we do have where you want to go. Uh, and the lights who are sitting one after another in the city would um, turn on and off when you pass them uh, to guide you the way. So what that whole thing does, it helps you to not look on your phone all the time uh, on that blue screen that Google provides. Uh, that's just sort of the background. Um, I want to talk about these glitches that we had uh, through uh, production. Um, 
we received a number of uh, 3D printed um, uh, shells and, and Hinkle Klötzchen without sensoric to be used. Uh, but what we, what we received was not entirely what we, what we ordered. Um, so the, the problematic was uh, the size uh, of that piece. Uh, precision, uh, especially on, on the edges uh, of the prints uh, on the very right hand side of the picture, you can see that the printing was most likely far too fast. Uh, with um, also a uh, distance from one layer to another uh, too high. Uh, so from these 10, 15 bits that we received, we actually couldn't use a single one. Uh, we made compromise at the end of the day, had a very good uh, design uh, who then, um, a product designer, who then in, in a crafty kind of way uh, did put together these pieces. Um, now, before we receive these, uh, uh, these 3D printed, uh, manufactured, large scale um, uh, prototypes, uh, we made smaller prototypes in our uh, Ultimaker. Um, and we kind of uh, hoped that we were actually receiving uh, a similar kind of magic, let's call it, um, since the, the little baby Hinkelklötzchen um, uh, are not just kind of amazing, they were just also really, really charming. And by now I think we have about 20 or 25 in the office. Um, that was kind of what we wanted uh, and what we were working towards. Uh, and then we had a look at how to actuate this. Uh, working together with Fraunhofer Institute, um, uh, which is also a research entity uh, within uh, Germany and Europe, um, we created uh, a sensor stack, we created um, a, a kit basically where different sensors came together. Uh, what you can see here is our uh, industrial designer who we hired, who, who put everything together. Um, uh, the bit that is in his hands here is a, is a small connection piece between the battery module and the light module. Uh, so there was some kind of uh, precision uh, at hand. Uh, the actual interior of um, the Hinkelklötzchen, which is like the, the technology that you can see here, is a Raspberry Pi uh, and a number of sensors, which would then be put together as that, uh, as that sensor stack to, to be put into the larger uh, pieces. Um, on the left hand side is the small uh, tiny one that uh, we printed uh, at home uh, and on the right hand side you can see the first prototype working. Uh, the lights would change in um, uh, from an idle state to an actuated state and then going back into an idle state which we uh, just sort of try to trigger here um, with just a you know bag from our sandwiches or something like this, uh, just to sort of make the point. Um, in the background, you can see a Texas sensor, which has a number of sensors in there in one compartment, uh, quite handy in a way, but for our purposes, um, it wasn't quite sufficient. So let me go to the, to the play part um, of, that, of that project. Um, so when we say play, we actually mean uh, putting these things in the environment and, and seeing what happens. Uh, in our project, uh, we worked, worked together with um, uh, a company in Helsinki in Finland. Uh, and uh, we also had partners who were working on, on the app to, to be used together with these lights. Uh, and in Finland, uh, in Helsinki, we had a little park. Uh, and in that park, you can see locations of where um, the citizens and also um, the people who helped us from the city um, were indicating which spots are kind of uh, a little bit gloomy or a little bit dark or just not so so nice to walk along. Uh, and then we said, okay, let's let's position the lights there. The lights themselves, they talk to each other through uh, through wireless. Uh, and the way you connect to the lights uh, is, is uh, through a cloud, uh, which also works through a wireless uh, connection. So when we arrived in, in Helsinki, uh, as you can see, we kind of positioned where the lights would go. Uh, when we came to Helsinki, there was snow, it was cold. 
uh, and we could find the positions where the lights should go. So that was like a, a first kind of uh, obstacle, uh, but we managed that also through through playing, let's say that. Um, uh, we then checked uh, on site uh, if the light is working, uh, we connected everything, uh, we made plans about changing the batteries, uh, which was um, a huge issue uh, since it was so cold. Uh, and then we positioned them uh, on, on site. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, not all of these slides that we received from the 3D printer uh, were usable. Most of them were not. So we had two functioning lights on site. Uh, that is uh, our colleague from Fraunhofer Institute uh, kind of bringing his suitcase with, with uh, all the equipment. Um, then we positioned them uh, we could control uh, individual colors, uh, individual lights and the colors of the lights, which is which is super nice. And uh, what we then realized is that uh, by putting these lights there, which here you can see only two, and that is uh, the round one is like a helper, helper light. Um, uh, people started engaging with them. And uh, we were just standing there and observing how, how the kids looked at them, uh, how, how people, went closer, uh, touched the lights. Uh, and then our colleague from Fraunhofer would actually change the color of that light. Uh, so that was like super fun. Um, and um, yeah, so this is basically the, the little story of the of the Hinkelklötzchen, uh, which made its way from a simple sketch via uh, 3D printing, scripting, uh, being equipped with sensors to kind of changing um, uh, changing a, a, a space within uh, uh, apartment buildings to to something where people would engage with and uh, just be just be happy that they are there, and that's it from my side. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Liz. That was fantastic. Um, we've got a slightly different uh, one now because um, uh, Gareth Neal, who's coming up next, has prepared a video presentation for us. So he's going to play that for us and then he's going to be joining the panel discussion later. So rather than him introducing it, we're just going to see the film he's prepared. In the past, things were different. There wasn't the same emphasis on speed of production. We used the resources around us to make things that we needed rather than things we wanted.
can't we just design a machine? Surely this could be done quicker. Come on, can you do it quicker, please? No wonder I had to speed this film up. So slow. Do it quicker. Please do it faster. Can't you do it more efficiently? I need it cheaper. Why didn't I just use an electric car to prove this point? I would have got there in a day and got it done in two. I would have been back before the weekend. I've used so much energy cycling there. I've had to eat so much. I'm never going to get carbon neutral status with this amount of consumption. You thought, you thought that by making your vessel with a CNC machine, things would turn out the same. How wrong you were. Is it any wonder that size don't line up when humans made the machines?
Kevin, you are a custodian of traditional Orcadian craft. With it comes great responsibility for its preservation, its reinvention, and its future. I think one of my missions in furniture is to explore how digital technologies are perceived and how they do have craft within them. Objects are alien to us when we see them because we don't understand how that object was made. I need to be able to reference 
the hand, the process, in order to have a relationship with that object. There's this Georgian piece of furniture trapped within this raw lumber. The object itself is like a glitch in The object itself is like a glitch in history is like a glitch in history it questions and challenges technique it questions and challenges technique the future and the past As we evolve, the tools we use evolve. You know nothing that I say. Master, moving stones around is one thing. This is totally different. No, no different. Only different in your mind. You must unlearn what you have learned. All right, I'll give it a try. No, try not. Do or do not. There is no crime. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. in time like tears in rain brilliant thank you very much for that Gareth oh, craft wars love it Revenge of the Thresher in the middle of there, which is a, a tool I use quite a lot in my youth. Um, okay, uh, next up we have uh, Alice Naylor, who's going to be talking to us about eye appeal is bio appeal, um, with reference to the Kenwood Chef and kitchen technology. Um, well, thank you for um, inviting me to speak at the symposium. My name is Alice Naylor, and um, I, um, I'm a product designer and a design historian by training. And I'm about to embark on a PhD with the wondrous title, I Appeal is By Appeal, the design, mediation and consumption of Kenwood appliances from 1946 to 2020. 
With my PhD in mind, I wanted to expand on the themes laid out here, including the character of the tool, its embodied use, and the significance, significance of object biographies, in this case, the Kenwood Chef. Applying a material culture approach to the kitchen appliances allows us to um, interrogate how they can be used to reflect contemporary social, economic and cultural changes, in particular those associated with notions of domesticity and normative practices of femininity. This thinking can be applied to tools that are imbued with the labour values and emotional resonances attached to domestic food creation and consumption. I'm focusing on several different models of Kenwood kitchen appliances as a means of interrogating the fluidity around the design change of kitchen tools and how gender identities are key to understanding their character, which in turn reflects how, I, how they are consumed and circulated. I wanted to start with the Kenwood Chef A700 by way of introduction. This particular version was launched at the Ideal Home Exhibition in 1950. It strikes me that the consumer can draw conclusions quite quickly about the character of this object. Its design, it's sturdy, it's colour, a sanitary shade of cream, not unlike a piece of hospital machinery, and the fluid lettering, it certainly looks well behaved. My interest, however, is not the tool, but the title it has been given, Chef, because it offers up a couple of different readings. In the logo and on the side, the word chef appears in inverted commas. I wonder if by endowing this with Excuse me, I just need to, um, I need to sort of see myself on the screen. I can't quite do that yet, but um, anyway, I'll continue. Um, my interest, however, is not in the tool itself, but the title it has been given, Chef, because it offers up a couple of different readings. In the logo and on the side, the word chef appears in inverted commas. I wonder if by endowing a domestic appliance with this title, Kenwood were conferring the A700 with professional, possibly male skills. Did the Kenwood chef invite women to perceive this tool not just as a labour-saving device, but one that offered a way of elevating the drudgery of cookery into something professional? I suggest that by branding it chef was to position the domestic space when they had more or less been shut out of the workplace in post-war Britain. It is not uncommon for women in professional kitchens to identify themselves as cooks as opposed to chefs. And this language demonstrates the gender assumptions applied to the business of making food today. I want to move on to a subject raised in this symposium about social agency, in particular women's social agency. One of the ways in which Kenwood's items were sold was via the performative nature of demonstrations. These were a vital part of Kenwood's selling model. I appeal is by appeal was coined by the founder of Ken, Kenwood, Kenneth Wood. Employees were trained to demonstrate and sell these kitchen appliances. You can see these women here in front of, um, in what looks like the A700 model. These demonstrations where customers could see how the appliances worked opened up more opportunities for, the, for women's social agency via the mediation of selling, in particular objects that were linked to the discourses on the gender division of labour and notions of womanhood. They were performative and persuasive and the visual and tactile nature of selling allowed the experts to story the object whilst being mindful of the cultural currencies they shared with the consumers. Moreover, the sellers were talking to a knowledgeable and captive audience who wanted to understand the changing character and value of these tools, how they might act as enablers in the kitchen and they were willing to pay for them. It is no surprise that these tools might act as a metaphor for the optimism of post-war life, the reframing of domestic labour and how we perceive practices of social agency. It was not all about demos in department stores. Another more informal way of selling was the displaying of tools inside the home. Men might have their tools in the tool shed, wives had theirs on the kitchen counter, which helps us to understand how they are circulated and consumed. The Kenwood chef in the domain of the home kitchen can signify many things, an object of display and spectacle as well as use and a milestone to the entry of marriage. The value additions demonstrated by the chef's weight and size would lead the consumer in no doubt that they were in possession of a significant item. In fact, it's so heavy you can barely lift it, so it's no wonder that it sat in splendour on the kitchen counter to be observed and admired. 
This advertisement from the early 1960s continues with a the theme that the right tool for the job can confer professionalism whilst playing into traditional notions of marriage. The underlying message being that the financial power lies with the man and kitchen work is for women. These constructs play with the idea of identities at home and normative ideas of work. But at least she's wearing a chef's hat, even if she's not a real chef. It demonstrates how this tool can be seen as an attempt to categorise and collate the multifarious ways in which the tensions of domestic work, ergo unpaid, and labour outside the home are governed and brokered. In the case of the Kenwood purchase for the wife portrayed in this advertisement, its entry into the kitchen was governed by the gift-giving breadwinner to insert the wife into the role of homemaker. There is, however, a subtle bit of brokering by the wife as the copy reads, cooking is fun, says my wife. Food preparation is a bore. Think of the meals I'd cook for you if you had a Kenwood chef. Note that it is you, the husband, that has the Kenwood chef, not I, the wife. He owns the tool, she does the labour. If we are to look at the changing character of tools, this is a useful point at which to introduce the slick and jaunty Kenwood Chef A701, which many of you may be familiar with, not least because this version has appeared on the kitchen counter of many homes since its introduction in 1960. You can see the model here with a more streamlined shape than its predecessor, and note that chef has been removed from the lettering on the side. This model was in production until 1976 and significant social, economic and cultural changes were taking place during this time. Designer Kenneth Grange was commissioned by Kenneth Wood to give the chef a new suit of clothes. And Grange asserted that we read a lot of value into the weight of things when you pick something up so that the moment, at that moment, you make an assumption about its value. We understand that the weight of a tool, be it heavy or light, plays an important role in the value additions we might attach to it. Kenwood appliances are held in high regard for their mass appeal, accessibility and playful efficiency with technology and aesthetics intertwined in developing goods for consumers hungry for the fresh and innovative. There is a great story attached to the A701. Grange ran out of time to make uh, the full working model. So he presented this half version against the mirror. You can see the images here. Ken was in, Kenwood was entranced by this humorous bit of trickery and Grange got his gig. He went on to design over a hundred appliances for Kenwood and he played an important part in giving these tools such a distinctive character. His reasoning that there is a temptation in British design to scorn the elements of style, fashion and pleasure. This, in my view, is the road to righteous boredom. Talking of character, this leads me on to another iteration of the Kenwood chef, the Chefette A320 from the 1960s. This version here and one designed by Grange. The size has been scaled down and the colour palette scaled up in keeping with the pop art sensibilities of the time. We might look to Richard Sennett's vision of a third kind of material consciousness here, where we invest inanimate objects with human qualities. I think Michael Craig Martin had the right idea with his vivid reimagining of a blender some 30 years later, rendered in colours that make you smile with a shape that is entirely familiar. Sennett writes at length in The Craftsman about his ideas of anthropophosis, and I think his theory can be applied to this Kenwood appliance. How we might encounter this tool with its clunk and thrum and whir invites us to imbue it with any number of human char characteristics. I cannot say for certain that the shape of the chefette was mimicking the changing body forms of women, but the energy and fervour of the times is surely reflected in the design. A decade after the chef, the chefette might suggest an evolution in the kitchen linked not only to the emergence of second wave feminism and the lightening of expectations of womanhood, but changes in the style of cooking. There might still be a dough hook to knead your daily bread, but there's also a blender attachment to help you mix your cocktails. Naming this device the chefette is worthy of a category all of its own, but I don't know about you, but when I look at this colourful and diminutive chefette, I feel very kindly towards it, but maybe that's just me. 
tool size and gender tropes, that is worthy of further interrogation. There are multiple websites and blogs devoted to the restoration of Kenwood appliances. These images here come from one I discovered that lays out in painstaking detail the methodologies for bringing your vintage model back to life. And this blog in particular lays out in painstaking detail to bring your vintage model back to life. It is larded with fantastic jargon such as gear train, planetary hub and of course grommet. The designers amongst you like me will get a proper thrill from not only seeing the disemboweling of this device and the immaculate way in which it has been restored, but the contribution it plays as part of the circular economy, that there continues to be such an interest in reconditioning these older models and that an individual has retained them speaks of the importance of object biographies and the meanings they offer us. It is surely only a matter of time before BBC Two's The Repair Shop brings a Kenwood appliance back to its former glory, and I will be watching it with rapt attention if that is the case. I wanted to give you a demonstration of my own Kenwood Chef XL from the 1970s, which was gifted to me by a family member. The plastic bowl bears the scars of use. It has turned a rather noxious colour but I can assure you its performance is exemplary. I concur with Shirley Conran, who declares its great advantage is its solidity. It doesn't shake and charge about all over the room. It hums efficiently instead of clattering. I don't think it will, I would cast any blame on my Kenwood Excel for a sunken sponge or a curdled mayonnaise. It is a very rewarding instrument to use that you can walk away from the Excel and leave it to do its job without supervision is a delight. And it is always well behaved, even if sinister plumes of smoke billowed forth from it when I used it a few weeks ago, but I know where I can go to get it fixed. I wanted to finish by showing you the key tools that have been part of the arsenal of Kenwood weaponry since the early days of its launch, the whisk, the dough hook and the K-beater. The design of this trio has barely changed, just the host to which they are attached. The design evolution of the Kenwood and other aspirational kitchen tools helps us to observe and understand the development and economies of particular materials, which in turn reflects on transitions of labour elsewhere. By focusing on Kenwood appliances, I hope I've persuaded you that in the case of this particular tool, it has played an important part in the reframing of labour values in the home kitchen and made its own contribution towards structures and practices of co-making and social agency. The intertwining of the charisma and energy of Kenneth Wood with the mischievous and prolific Kenneth Grange plays a part in understanding how I appeal is by appeal, the importance of object biographies and why we might bestow these tools with distinctive personalities. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alice. That was fantastic. Lots of uh, great memories there as well. Um, so now if I can ask uh, all of the panellists from uh, the first section, RISC, um, if they can get ready to come on screen now, um, make sure you're unmuted and um, your videos are on, you have all the usual <laughs> instructions, and uh, we'll begin the the group discussion. Um, I think what we'll do just with timings, we'll, we'll kind of combine the, the audience questions with, with the questions that we've, we've prepared in advance. Um, as we go along, just to reiterate, if you want to ask any questions of the panel, please put it in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, not the, not the um, general chat, because um, we'll have that on as we're talking and then we'll be able to um, uh, see how that works. Okay, so how are we doing? I think we've got I think we've got everybody. I'll, I feel, I'll, I'll get going there and if, if uh, people want to join in as they appear, um, that'll be good. Um, first question, I think it was kind of a, I think, oh, Phil's here, hello. <laughs> um, I think sort of ties in a lot of what the discussions from various people talked about and um, uh, it was basically about this comparison between traditional and modern tools. It's something which when I, edited Hole and Corner magazine that something was always sort of bugbear because people thought we were just about traditional craft and we weren't, you know, we were about any any tool or making process, whether that's CD or whatever. Um, so do, do we think that there's an artificial divide between traditional and modern 
tools and is that un unhelpful when we're talking about tools and making? I don't know if anybody wants to jump in. I think Gareth, it kind of applies quite a lot to your Star Wars film. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, um, I don't think it's helpful, no, because, uh, you know, as I kind of mentioned in the film, we there is a romance attached to tools and we can get very, um, very held up on that. Uh, and I think that can get in the way of the progression of the future. Uh, so many of the talkers this morning or this afternoon have really kind of delivered how progressive and how how it could complement the future and, you know, specifically within the craft industry, I think it can hold it up. Yeah. I think, you know, we've got to, we've got to, you know, progress the future of craft and we've got to redefine it and continually, uh, you know, move the territory forward. And, you know, if we get too hung up on, on our favorite tool, um, it's going to slow things down a bit. Mm. It's interesting that in your film there's that that threshing machine for cutting wheat and straw, which I used and I grew up near near a farm and you see that in the school holidays. And that the well the machine we used was pre First World War, nineteen oh nine, I think it was from. And whenever we spoke to the farmhands, they always said, Well, we we haven't found a better way of doing this. Like as you said, you know, you can't you can't do it digitally, you can't, you know, modern machinery doesn't cut the straw straw particularly well, the wheat for thatch but specifically so it's kind of interesting that thing like that there's a way to i wanted to look at how traditional tools you know were the cutting edge technology of their time and, it, and can we look back at why they're so efficient in order to scale up when you're then creating a digital tool or, or, or something more advanced well the, the threshing tool is a good example of how it utilized the whole sheath of the corn you know um and didn't damage it so more of the plant could be used. And I think that's a good metaphor for how perhaps we should look at the future in terms of uh, materials and resources, um, especially, you know, uh, through some of the presentations have really highlighted how resources are low and how we have to find new methods uh, to save power, to save on materials, to save on process. And, you know, that's by those looking back examples really highlight, you know, how historically we did things and how actually yeah, that's, the, that's perhaps the way we need to introduce things into the future. It's not necessarily using the old threshing machine, but, you know, by utilising all of something rather than 5% or 2% of something. Mm. I think that ties quite nicely into, into Phil's presentation and this idea of, you know, tools shaping the natural world, using natural processes as tools themselves and also using nature to help to shape your design. Um, and you use the the example of mycelium fill, which um, I know that the uh, designer, Seb Cox, furniture maker, he's, he's experimented with, with um, making mycelium products. And when you order online on his, on his website, you know, you order, I think it's a light fitting and you get, you know, normally it says, you know, you're, you're, you get the pop-up box saying when your order will be delivered and it says your product is being grown now, which is great. So you have to wait for it to grow before it appears. But it's, it's fascinating that that, that sort of, um, the sort of dividing lines between the man-made and, and natural processes seem to be dissolving and, and we seem to be learning more and more how we can use them to our advantage, but also how we can learn from the natural world to, to shape our, our own processes. For sure, yeah. I mean, uh, I think it, it's also about how it is that we can start um, opening awareness to new kinds of paradigms in terms of the ways we're, we're sourcing our resources and using our resources. The, the whole idea that you're, you're, you're buying a consumer product that's been grown rather than has been excavated. You know, if, you, if you imagine um, in, um, the, the same, same way you're describing the mycelium chair, being told that uh, to the consumer it's being grown. And we take that back to the beginning of the 20th century with the Bauhaus. You know, imagine they'd be saying, well, it's being excavated, we're extracting the ore, um, <laughs> we're, we're um, putting in a huge amount of embodied energy to extract this. So, I mean, I, I think it's, it's really important that, um, that there are these methods that are starting to point to new paradigms of, of production. Um, and, and the groan is a, a very interesting one because it, it starts to tie into questions of circular economy, 
uh, that the whole idea about mycelium is that you're using substrates that are essentially waste streams from other industries, biological waste streams, high in lignocellulose. Mm. cellulose. Um, so so this, this starts to kind of talk about um, ways in which we can start to make deeper connections in the products that we're, we're, we're producing and consuming uh, that, that have um, a, a considerably less um, consequential impact on environment. Mm. Actually, while, while we're on the subject, there was a, um, an audience question from uh, Pranit Bansal. Um, I don't know if you saw this already, Phil, but um, they asked, to what extent does biohybrid architecture and its tools address the causes of environmental breakdown for them to be seriously considered as a tool to address these issues? So I, I think, does that mean that you have to, there is, you know, there's a, um, it, environmentally, the actual tool you're using could, could then break down. So you need to, where you know, it, in, in terms of wear and tear, you need to bear that into consideration. Uh, well, I, I, I think I think the the, the question the, the question is an interesting one. Yeah, I think we've. Um, I, I, I can't say that um, we can talk about biohybrid architectures as being the magic bullet uh, or addressing all the com all all the um, um, the the underlying thrusts that are causing environmental breakdown. Uh, but in, in terms of the building industry, we, we know that this is a, a, a real two emissions, um, things like urban development and, and, and urban sprawl um, are, are causing losses of biodiversities and, and rich ecologies. Um, so we, we've got to understand that the built environment does actually contribute to these issues. And therefore, it becomes um, incredibly poignant upon us to start trying to find alternatives. Now, one, one of those ways of trying to address that is, uh, as I was um, uh, trying to point out in, in the talk, um, that we try and find ways to become more efficient, perhaps um, more homeopathic in our use of materials that have high embodied energy. Um, that is certainly a worthy approach but I think we've got such uh, an enormous challenge you know, the doubling of building stock to deal with the, with, um, uh, the um, prospective increase in population um, essentially equates to having to build equivalent to the Man equivalent to Manhattan every month for the next 40 years um, and to be doing that in, in kind of ways um, that um, follow from the existing paradigm, I think are really unsustainable. So it becomes really imperative that we try and find alternative paradigms, um, which, which can supplement um, and uh, which, um, and, and, and this is why I think you know, that this kind of idea of the grown is a, is a really interesting one. Mm -hmm. It's also a way in which I see that it, it opens up the possibility of moving the idea of architecture and construction away from it being a very specialized um, and high capital cost entity. So the moment you begin to talk about growing your own architecture, uh, where you can be harnessing your own waste streams, you can be using scaffolds made of kugomi weave, which anyone can master. It's a basking, basket making technique. Um, you know, it, it suddenly makes things much more accessible. And you know, potentially there's, there's the the opportunity of essentially democratizing these technologies to make them available much more broadly. Mm. Um, and, and then the other aspect is also that they have a particular aesthetic, um, which embodies this kind of idea about new values. And I think it's really imperative that if we've got an increased social, uh, sorry, increased environmental consciousness, we should be constructing our environments to actually reflect that. And um, I, I, I would argue that in many ways, we, we're yet to find the right kinds of um, um, modes of expression that, that really capture this. Mm. Um, there's another comment that's popped up, which realized that, but I'll just, I'll just make sure we can get all the panelists to talk first of all. So I'll come back to that in a minute. But um, Alice, uh, in terms of the, the Kenwood chef, um, I was quite fascinated by you know, the, obviously the sexism of the advertising and the fact that it was, you know, it's all about 
freeing freeing the woman from the kitchen in a way but also there's at the same time there's it's we've seen that an increased modernity of the kitchen but at the same time there's a sort of return to sort of artisanal cooking which seems to be very much aimed at the male you know it's like this kind of macho thing of like i'm going to go and forage for food and use use like you know a massive knife to to then sort of create some sort of uh, you know traditional soup or whatever i'm just quite interested in how you see that that's got contra- contrasting like mm. we can make your life so much easier with all this technology but at the same time there's it's almost like what gareth was saying about the the, the contrast between the sort of traditional way of making and the and the um modernity I mean, it is an interesting thing because actually i wrote in my master's about butter um becoming a luxury commodity and i interviewed mm. butter men um and actually they weren't very macho men but there is a sense that the the kind of the touch of the hand you know back to senate's thing mm. uh, quite apart from the back you know it is um I, I i was not able to establish when i did my dissertation master's dissertation why it was predominantly men but it really was so at the same time this machine was freeing up labor for women that wasn't really crazy i mean the particular crux of it is the the the, the person buying it ostensibly in the early part of the kind of 50s and 60s was was the man um and that's so apparent in all the advertising now the advertising is very tongue-in-cheek and i was you know showing that to, to make a particular point and there are other many things you can kind of unpick from that um but the artisanal um, movement now being uh, men it is is I'm very aware of that but I can't actually I can't work quite <laughs> work out how that is mm. um, but it is it, I think it's a certain amount of fetishization about certain sorts of tools and minimalism and I can do this and possibly the going back to nature particularly with things like butter because it's such a simple process um so yeah it's it's definitely the artisanal movement where you are actually moving away from tools altogether even though you do need tools to make butter um you need tools to to to, 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 to cook in the kitchen even if it's just a great big knife that you hewn from your wood and your you know your your iron that you've probably got from the ground in in it from somewhere but that that is yeah that's something i've, I've come across a, a, a great deal interesting mm, and um Liz, i just want to pick up on this idea of you know the digital tool and cybernetics in general and how that it gives us a, a wider social definition of what tools are how they use and also raises the question of you know who the maker actually is if you, you know if, if there's not a defined author of something or using a program to then set a process in in, in action so um i'm kind of interested in that and also this kind of feeling of it being it, quite often it seems like a sort of brave new world kind of scary thing of the, the robots taking over which is a bit of a theme of you know it's emerging here but also how emancipating that can be and it's you know it encourages diversity and it offers you know potentially new material qualities oh you're muted sorry Liz. <laughs> can you hear me yeah oh, you are good. muted um thank you very much for that for that question which uh which is quite big i have to say yeah. so i was sort of trying to depict what what you what you're asking mm. um now my first question would of course be uh what is the current social definition uh which could be widened uh so how would we actually have a, a social definition of what tools are um the question of of uh, cybernetics and the digital tool i'm not entirely sure if we have to put this together because cybernetics uh happens uh without digital tools so uh you probably do know the saying uh it takes a whole village to to raise a child um, and, and that has to do with, with cybernetics and communication. So there are certain relationships between people, between the child, um, what the child understands, the tools also that the child learns to use through, um, uh, through the people in the village. So I'm not entirely sure if, if we have to put cybernetics with the digital tool. But if I want to take that question and, um, and go to the, the second part of that question where you say encouraging diversity, uh, new uses, uh, new social material qualities. I would actually want to suggest to answer that question with yes. Um, since uh, we are somehow 
I mean, of course, we are losing certain certain bits uh, by focusing on on new tools. Uh, but I think we are also embrace, embracing new things. Like, for instance, what we are doing here right now, we have to figure out tools that create a social environment uh, in which we can learn from each other. So uh, I think we are, what we're doing here is we are somehow, maybe not quite crafting yet, but we are definitely uh, developing and designing uh, a spatial configuration. At the moment, our spatial configuration is uh, in a grid. Uh, I can see Alice on the, on the top left and I can see Christiane Matz on the on the bottom right. So uh, this is kind of cumbersome, uh, but, but this is sort of a cybernetic tool where we play with each other, where we talk to each other and create that space, but where we also um, work with the tool itself. So um, uh, we have so many different realities happening here. I mean, I have three screens, you know, it's, it's, it's a fairly comfortable way of working. Uh, somebody else might have a small laptop. So uh, there, there's a different ways that we can, we can learn to, to, let's say, encouraging diversity of what these social spaces or, or social uses are by the individual tools we're using. I hope that kind of makes sense. And uh, when it comes to the architectural uh, tools uh, or production tools like the 3D printer, uh, I also think that um, we do create new uh, social material qualities by uh, learning each other's skills. Uh, so I can start learning to, to print with clay or, uh, you know, with, with a, a biodegradable material. I can start learning to work in horticulture and at the same time grow my chair. Um, but I'm not sure if this is, this is widening a social definition of what tools are and how we use them. It may just shift it slightly. Mm. Yeah, good point. Good. Okay, well, um, I think just to catch up a bit of time, we're probably going to end it there, but there's a few other really fascinating questions which have popped up in the Q&A, so um, we will try and answer them. We might answer them by typing them as, as the afternoon goes on, and if we have time in the, the final discussion, I'll um, bring those in. But if there's a question aimed at a specific um, panellist, uh, if you want to have a look at the Q&A, you can, you can reply to that. I see Alice has already replied to one, which we, um, we're going to bring in. Um, great, thank you for that.